Justin Bookie is a global ping pong player. He's a U.S. Open medalist, the best-selling author of Ping Pong Leadership, 18 Principles to Succeed at Any Table in Business, Sports, and Life. Welcome to the show, Justin. Thanks, George. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah, excited to have you on. Tell us a little about your personal life, some more about your work, and why you do what you do. Sure. Grew up in Seattle, rainy place. That means we had a lot of time in the basement at the ping pong table. You know, it gets dark at 3.45 p.m. when I'm walking home from school. And um, yeah, my parents were pretty good players. So when we moved into this house with a ratty old table in the basement when I was six, they're like, oh, we'll tell you all about this table and what it can do and it, how much fun it is. And I just never left the game. Um, and I would beg any house guests, cousins, friends, anybody, let's play, let's play, let's play. I was a shrimpy crit kid growing up. Um, so basketball, football were kind of out of the question. Um, now, of course, I'm um, big and five foot seven inch. So um, <laughs> totally different story. No, um and uh, so even in high school, I I played a lot of sports and wrestling and track and soccer, and I was a decent athlete, but I just always stuck with table tennis. It just had this special allure to me, and I was pretty good. And then I realized I could beat up on all these big basketball and football players who would be pushing me around otherwise. And they would... and. I, Strangely, I would actually get a little respect from it. And I wasn't expecting that. They're like, whoa, dude, that's pretty awesome. Wow, that's a cool sport. What you do with the ball and all that. That was a little surprising. And it actually gave me a little more currency than I thought I would get from that. Um, that was really just icing on the cake, though. It's not why I play, but it was a nice, pleasant surprise. Anyway, um, fast forward through schooling and I became a lawyer and, and a digital strategist, brand strategist. I always kept these two worlds separate. I would study hard. That was important to me and my parents and our family. And I would work hard at my jobs. Definitely worked hard at being a lawyer and, and you know, law school and you know, being a lawyer. And at the same time, I, I would then go home at, late at night or on the weekends and really, really pursue table tennis and train hard and do competitions from a young age. And I never realized those two worlds would cross. And even, you know, I would be in my 20s and working in a law firm or at agencies, digital agencies, and would have a table maybe. And I, I was so grateful for that because finally I could experience that in a little bit of both worlds. There would be a table in the hallway or a separate wing of a large agency. And I would play at 4 p.m. just for 20 minutes just to get my brain going. It's better than a shot of espresso. And it built community and I would meet people in my office who I wouldn't otherwise know in a big office, right? And then um, pandemic came along and I finally had a chance to sit down and really distill all these principles I had learned over the years, principles that I had learned from amazing table tennis coaches. I was so lucky because I could learn from some of the best in the world. Olympians, national champions, world champions in the table tennis world. And they get deep. Like my coach is an Olympian. I've been training with her for 20 years. It's not about just here's the correct angle on a forehand drive. Yes, but it's also what are you afraid of? What's holding you back? Where do you want to be? What kind of player do you want to be? Where do you feel comfortable standing? Where do you feel comfortable as a person, what are you trying to achieve? Is victory your only goal? I mean, these are really philosophical questions, right? And she's like, so she's more than a trainer. She's a she's a guru in a lot of ways, right? Anyway, so that's that's one side. The other side was working at places like XPRIZE, where I was working with Peter Diamandis, the founder of XPRIZE, or I got to work with Paul Jacobs, the, the, the CEO of Qualcomm, and I've learned from guys like Nolan Bushnell, who founded Atari. They have really amazing stories and amazing things that drive them to success. And they've had failures and they've had amazing successes. And so gradually I learned maybe, a, I don't know, a dozen years ago, it started to finally dawn on me that these principles that help these amazing table tennis elite players succeed, they're really the same principles that help really innovative leaders succeed. 
And so getting back to pandemic times, I had a chance to sit back and really distill these principles. And I came up with um, 18 for the book, these Pong principles, I call them, and distilled that. And, and you know, there's 18 chapters in the book, 18 Pong principles. And I got to, I, I interviewed one leader that exemplifies a principle for each chapter. So that's what the book is about. I love it. I, we were talking earlier, I played tennis growing up and now as an adult looking back, maybe similar to the process you went through the pandemic of distilling down your principles, sport teaches us so much and there's so much to be learned from it. And I think that anybody who ever played high school football will tell you all about how important that was, but it's true of tennis or golf or ping pong if you take the time to really think about it. So one of the 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 principles that you talk about is is your ready position. And I'd love to dig into that a little bit. Sure thing. Yeah. So that is all about identifying yourself, your style of play, and how you can most adapt to whatever you want to do, whatever quirks you have to the game at hand and the point at hand. Um, that I should back up and say each chapter is has two parts. One is in the game and one is in leadership. So there's 18 chapters and each is divided into two parts. Here's the Pong principle in the game. And that's what um, Pong principle number six, what's your ready position? So in the game, that's like, like in table tennis, you're like, you know, you're crouched down, angled certain way, elbow up, paddle more or less in the middle of your playing field of vision. So you can quickly go forehand or backhand, depending where the serve is. And the thing is, there's not one exact ready position because we're all different players and we have different priorities, strategies, and different physical characteristics and playing styles. Same in tennis. Um, you may be a little more adept at, I don't know, if it's a fast serve, blocking it or slicing it or going just for a pure smash or maybe a more touch top spin, whatever, right? So that probably affects how you're standing. And of course, it's dependent on who's serving to you and what their strengths are, right? So that's the part of the game. And then in leadership, I was talking with Will Shorts, and he's the New York Times puzzle editor, and he's on NPR, the, the puzzle master, top of the game, because that's like the pinnacle of his position. And um, he's always done games. He's always created games. When he was a kid, he used to make them for his mom and his brother. And then he joined clubs, and he sold his first puzzle to uh, a magazine when, when he was really young, 12, 11, 13. 13 years old he is drawn to that so much no matter what his other job was and he actually went to law school because he thought that was the right thing to do never in his heart though he was always doing games in a way that was his ready position because no matter what his other job was he would stay in tune with the gaming community and he would then he would go and he would run these competitions just because he loved it and of course, the more you do that, the more you are called to do that because people recognize your efforts. And so when finally the New York Times lead editor position came, op came open for the, the crossword puzzle, New York Times, which may be the most famous crossword puzzle in the world, he was so ready for that anyway because it was his natural ready position to be always in the puzzle world that he was kind of a natural and he got the job. Right. So that's where your ready position is something that is an immediate by the fraction of a second position. And it's also a long term lifetime decision. Are you going to be ready? You could be a graphic designer. Your ready position is definitely going to involve AI these days. Right. You could be a car mechanic. Ready position is going to be working with e electric electronic vehicles, probably as well as internal combustion whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Lawyer, you better be getting used to new developments in AI and so forth. Um, I mean, depending on, of course, there, there's many variations depending on your specialty. Anyway, so that's kind of ready position. As a tennis player, you must, ha you must have 
altered your ready position depending on the circumstances, right? Sure, sure. And the same thing goes with pickleball today. And pickleball. <laughs> yeah. And but fundamentally, as as so many people are, are coming into the world of pickleball that don't have the tennis or ping pong background, so they don't necessarily understand, I need to get my racket up and I need to be on the balls of my feet and I need to be to ready and do a split step when the ball is coming to me so that I can respond appropriately, whatever comes my way. Um, that's just not an obvious thing to people because I, I, I watch them and they just don't understand that. They're just kind of standing around and, and reaching versus moving and, 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 and bouncing around the court. And, but that's also true of the temperature. Is the sun going to be in my face? Did the last point go great? Did it go terrible? What did I do last night? How do I feel? Did I have a fight with my wife? So the ready position from my perspective just means whatever is coming my way, I'm going to position myself to be able to handle it. Yes. It's highly situational, highly adaptive. And so that's why I see the audience for the book is anybody who envisions themselves as a leader, and that could be a food truck owner, an independent UX professional graphic designer, all the way up to a you know regional sales manager to manager to Fortune 100 CEO. We're all leading ourselves or others to greater opportunity for success. Okay. You take that group and anyone who can appreciate ping pong on any level. You might have played it a few times in kindergarten or anything. Or substitute basketball or field hockey or lacrosse or pickleball because we all have our either sports or hobbies. Anything can pertain to a ready position. It doesn't necessarily need to be ping pong. That just mm -hmm. happens to be my main channel of influence. But for you now, it could be pickleball or tennis recollection, uh, recollection. Maybe you were a high school wrestler. There's certainly re you know ready position in that. And depending whether you're, you're on offense or defense or trying to go for a reversal or a takedown or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So and certainly being a parent, I need to, oh. <laughs> I, I need to have a ready position and a husband, I need to have a ready position and just all of it. I, I have to have that understanding about myself. So I think it, 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 it translates to, to everything. Yes, absolutely. And it, it's, it's physical, it's mental, it's strategic. Mm -hmm. Your resume is part of your resume, uh, ready position. Mm -hmm. Keep it fresh. That's being ready because you never know. Keep your LinkedIn profile fresh, your photo fresh, because that's all ready position. Because my favorite definition of luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right? The preparations is, is half of it. That's the ready position. The opportunity could strike at any minute from any direction. If you are prepared, that's it. You can respond in a blink of an eye. Yeah. How did you pick which was going to be number one and what is what is the number one principle? Number one is be careful what you measure and why. Okay. That that was inspired partly by the Prime Minister of Iceland. That's why I interviewed for that, Katrine mm -hmm. Jakobsdottir. <clears throat> I thought that was a natural start because whenever we look at any body of information and strategies and principles, let's be careful because there's a lot of rabbit holes. Not all of them are good. In this day and age, we have unli virtually unlimited data at our fingertips more than ever before. When I was first doing brand strategy, content strategy, web 1.0, 20, 25 years ago, it was a precious thing. We had to pay a lot of money for a lot of metrics, analytic data, right? Now it's it's big data is everywhere. It's easy to it's easy to find and package. The human element of interpreting and having an intelligent filter system is more important than ever. So if you choose to just look at the raw data, you can see patterns however you want. So just be careful. What you look at, I've seen um, when it comes to coaching table tennis, to start off that chapter, I've seen a coach and a kid talking about this match. <clears throat> um, this kid who was maybe 10, 11 years old, a junior, had a fantastic coach. They're warming up for the U.S. Nationals. The kid got a silver medal in this regional tournament. 
coach asks him, okay, so how would you rate your performance today? Oh, hey, well, maybe a minus. I mean, I didn't win it, but I got the silver. I went seven and one in my matches. That was a good day. Coach says, okay, fair enough. And congratulations. That was a, you know, it was a strong performance. I'd give you a C plus B minus kids. Like what? Like, yeah, well, <clears throat> you lost your temper twice. That almost cost you that one match. What's your best stroke? Oh, um, my forehand loop drive. Okay, you used it. I counted 38 times. That's actually a really small amount for your primary weapon. You should be using that at least double, triple that. You, you missed three out of your nine best serves. You did your best serve nine times in the last match. You missed it three times. That's a horrible percentage. We can't have that. You should be either perfect, maybe one miss, but really shoot for perfect if you're only doing it nine times. These are all things that I'm counting, the coach said. These are important metrics because what's the objective? This regional tournament, you're going to have plenty of small regional tournaments. We want to get you to win at nationals. That's the overriding metric. The kid was just looking at today. The kid was in a way measuring the wrong things. So there's so many things we can be measuring and so many missteps and blind al or wrong alleys we can go down. And that's just an example. Getting to the prime minister of Iceland, she talks about GDP. That is a woefully inaccurate singular source, one number that's been used for decades to measure an economic growth and development of a nation. It discounts so many things that are actually important. And she quotes RFK, the original RFK, not RFK Jr., um, about GDP measures everything except what is important. Paraphrasing. Huh. So she's come up with, in conjunction with New Zealand, Scotland, Wales, and a couple other countries, a wellness index, 39 indicators, because they polled the people of Iceland and they said, what is really important in your life? It's not GDP. That's a this macro measure of a nation at large. That doesn't matter to the people in, in the schools and the homes and, and the streets. Health, healthy family, healthy relationships, healthy neighborhoods, good jobs and job security, social connections with small circles and large circles in the community, things like that, environmental health. Those are metrics that matter. And so if we measure the wrong thing, we're going to get a really distorted picture of how well our society is doing. America has a great GDP, number one in the world. China's number two. There's a lot of other issues we have to deal with, though that go well beyond GDP. It counts the number, GDP accounts for the number of cars produced, but it doesn't account for pollution from fossil fuels, for example, or it accounts for the number of sodas sold and produced. It does not account for obesity and diabetes that can be caused for that, from that. So that's just an example of, we really gotta be careful of how we're measuring, why we're measuring, what we're measuring. Yeah, so easy to, uh to track everything you've just been saying and being mindful of what is truly important, what really matters versus what feels good or what's what's vain or what has just commonly been talked about or tracked. So I appreciate all that. I love it. Sure. Well, Justin, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people learn more about you? Where can they get their copy of Ping Pong Leadership, 18 Principles to Succeed at Any Table in Business, Sports, and Life? Easy enough just to go to pingpongleadership.com. You can read all about the who's involved, the principles, me getting cut, getting in contact with me. And then it's um the book is available on Amazon and other fine retailers. And um, I just want to note also, we've been talking about some high concepts here. And on the practical level, all of them do boil down to what you can do in your daily life and your daily challenges. And there's game points at the end of each chapter that really help you home in on what you're going through and how you can apply it to your daily and weekly and monthly experience. So I don't want people to get the impression this is high-minded academia only. I love it. Super yeah. practical. Take and apply it immediately. Get better. That's what we're all about here. Absolutely, man. You Any table. The 
And each, yeah. we all have our tables. You just identify what table you have and you're facing in your life. I love it. If you enjoyed this as much as I did, show Justin your appreciation. Share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Go to pingpongleadership.com and check out all things Justin and get your copy of Ping Pong Leadership wherever you buy your books, certainly Amazon. We will link that in the notes as well. And uh, get better at whatever table that you are at. Thanks again, Justin. Thank you so much, George. See you at the pickleball courts. There you go, man. Until next time, remember, do your part by doing your best.